program on constitutional government, our, uh, our series of Friday lunches, the first of them. We've got eight of them this year. And uh, we're very pleased to have Jed Rubenfeld, who's a professor at the Yale Law School. And he's the author of a recent article, which is about uh, a riddle and a myth. The riddle of, of rape by deception and the myth of sexual autonomy. He's a graduate of Princeton and uh, went to Harvard Law School, and now he's at Yale. So that's a, a triple package, which is, <laughs> by chance, uh, the title of one of his most, of his most recent book with uh, his wife, who is uh, not here. We're not getting a sighting of the tiger mother of Yale. But um, we'll wait, wait, take it into your, take it into account. <laughs> when, uh, listening to Professor Rubenfeld. He's the author of Freedom and Time, which is a theory of constitutional self-government, uh, Revolution by Judiciary, the structure of American constitutional law. And he writes uh, crime novels. <laughs> what? There's one called The Understanding. Interpretation of Murder. Interpre the Interpretation of Murder. <laughs> that requires interpretation, if you didn't know that. <laughs> so uh, he'll talk for a while, and then we'll uh, uh, have our questions. <laughs> so thanks very much, Professor Rittenbaugh. Is it OK if I'm up, up here? You, you all can hear me? Well, um, I just want to say thank you to all of you for coming, but especially thank you to Professor Mansfield. It was a, had the privilege uh, a million years ago of uh, serving as one of his TFs, and uh, it had a great uh, influence on me, and uh, uh, it's an honor to, uh, to be here today, so thank you very much. Um, without any further preliminaries, given the topic, I think I'm just going to jump right in, so I'm going to tell you about a case. It's a simple case. It's a real case. Deceptively simple. So a man uh, approaches a woman uh, in, uh, on a city street. They don't know each other. He's in his 20s. She's in her 20s. Um, and he engages her in conversation. And uh, after they get to know each other a little bit, uh, he persuades her that he uh, belongs to, he's a member of a certain religion. That he, uh, specifically in this case, that he's uh, Jewish and that he um, is unmarried, and that he uh, has a serious romantic interest in her. That would be the phrase that the court would use later. Um, not long thereafter, they had sexual relations, exchanged phone numbers. Not long thereafter, she learned that none of those three things were true. He wasn't Jewish. He, in fact, was married with two kids, and he did not have a serious romantic interest in her. He was uh, charged with rape prosecuted and found guilty of rape, not based on a finding that there had been force or a threat of force or overpowering or uh, anything like that, but on the grounds of the deception. So it was rape by deception. Um, now, would be my guess that if I asked for a show of hands, that most of you in this room would say that you did not consider that an act of rape. In fact, I'll ask for a show of hands. How many people think, no, that's not rape? Okay. Now, in saying so, you reflect the general American attitude toward this. The case I just described took place, occurred in Israel, where they have the doctrine of rape by deception. In America, we don't. We don't think there, that, that that crime exists. And so I can tell you that your reaction corresponds with the holdings of American courts and with the strong intuitions of most people. Here's the problem. If I ask you what rape is, how would you answer that question? The answer most commonly given today is very simple. And this answer is given by philosophers who write about rape, by judges when they say off the cuff what rape consists of, and by hundreds and hundreds of lay people when they're describing what rape is. And this is the definition of sexual assault or rape that's encoded, that, that's uh, written into the um, sexual misconduct provisions now at most American colleges 
and universities, and that is sexual relations without consent. I mean, what else would you think rape would be? It's having sex without one of the party's consent. But here's the problem. Deception, misrepresentation, fraud, vitiates consent. A yes given under circumstances of deception is not a valid consent. This is true everywhere in the law. So somebody comes to your door and they knock on your door and they say they're the meter reader. Do you guys have meter readers still in? We do in New Haven. The guy comes, he's in a unit, you know, he says he's a meter reader. He's going to come and read the meter and you, and you let him in, but he's not the meter reader. He tricked you. The moment he walks in your door, he's committed the crime and tort of trespass. Trespass just is the entrance onto somebody else's property without their consent. If Bernie Madoff gets you to invest your money uh, because he's going to invest it in, you know, uh, profitable investments, but actually he's just pocketing it because it's a Ponzi scheme. Bernie Madoff has committed and, and has been convicted of theft. That's th theft just is the taking of somebody's property without consent. That's what it is. But if somebody tricks you out of your money, they are committing theft by deception. A horn book example of battery. Battery is just the offensive or injurious touching of somebody without their consent. A horn book example of battery is, you can find this repeated over and over and in the restatements of law, a doctor or someone pretending to be a doctor says they're a doctor and convinces, and it's always gendered in this way in the examples in the horn books, convinces a woman to disrobe and physically examines her, but he's not a doctor or he was lying and it wasn't like a medically necessary procedure, has committed battery. In all these ways, where the law protects consent, it protects against fraud or deception as well as force. Now, just because the law does this, I mean, that doesn't mean it's justified or the right way of understanding consent, but here the justification for the law's treatment of consent is very clear. I mean, it would be very strange if, for example, Bernie Madoff could say, oh, no, I didn't, I'm not guilty of any crime. Every, all of them agreed to give me their money. What, what, I'm not guilty. They agreed. They consented to give me. That would be a very strange result. More broadly, we could say, this would take some argument, we could say that laws that protect consent, protect against violations of your consent, what do they protect? They're protecting people's autonomy. They're protecting people's ability to make autonomous choices. And it is a familiar, almost uncontroversial position among those who think about autonomy, that autonomy is vitiated equally by two things, force and fraud. That's why all libertarians are always going to tell you that the thing that they can't put up with is force or fraud, libertarianism being a philosophy that, of course, is there to protect individual autonomy, and for both force and fraud undermine autonomy. And it's a fact worth observing that new modern understandings of rape are all based on the principle of an, and ideal value of sexual autonomy. It wasn't always so. It wasn't that long ago when Western, English, American sex law had nothing to do with autonomy. Not that long ago, all sex was a criminal offense other than sex inside a heterosexual marriage reproductive sex. Actually, if even married people used contraception, even that was a crime. There was no such thing as sexual autonomy. In those days, rape did not protect a person's sexual autonomy. That was, nobody had any sexual autonomy. That wasn't a recognized principle in sex law. Sex law protected a certain conception of virtue. Sex law, rape in particular, protected against defilement, female defilement. Men could not be raped under traditional, that men could not be raped till very recently. So sex law for hundreds of years did not protect autonomy at all, it protected certain conceptions of virtue and in particular rape law protected against defilement. But that's not the way we understand it anymore. And when we started to change our understanding of rape, a new principle or concept was needed to step into this breach. And that principle or concept was sexual autonomy and everybody judges, philosophers, everybody that you, if you did a literature search, you would see that as soon as people are starting to talk about rape as, if they're defining it as sex without consent, the word autonomy, specifically the phrase sexual autonomy, will not be far off. That's what they think they're protecting. 
But if they are, then sex by deception should be rape. That's the problem. That's the riddle. If you think rape consists of sex without consent, of unconsented to sex, you yourself should believe that the case I first hypothesized, well, it's not a, hypo it's not a hypothetical, that that case was a case of rape and that the Israeli courts have it right. Now, in, in the rest of my few minutes of talking, I will be making an argument of the following form. If you agree with me that rape by deception is not rape, that is, if you want to stick with your original intuition, what follows? Okay? So if you don't, and a very respected, well-respected philosopher has written in response to my article, the argument up to this point is correct. The mistake is in thinking that sex by deception is not rape. Or he says, look, we don't have to call it rape, but call it a, it's a, it should be a crime. And okay, if you don't go to jail for 25 years or life, you should go to jail for some, you know, five years, or we can call it something else. But it should be a crime. So I'm not really going to give you a full argument against that position. My argument in what follows may not speak to you if you took that view, but I will make a few remarks about why you might be hesitant about taking that view. This will not be a full knockdown argument, but a few remarks I, I, I will make, you know, about why that might be problematic. So first of all, we conceal a lot when we have sexual relations with other people. Everybody does. To begin with, we do not. It's almost impossible to imagine someone disclosing all relevant material facts about themselves before they have sex. Now, when the law takes really seriously the idea that people shouldn't be deceived, if it's serious about deception, it takes that form. It says you must disclose relevant material information, and an omission to do so violates the law. Now, not all laws take that form, but if law gets really serious about deception, that's, that's what it says. But we can go beyond that. There's a great deal of affirmative misrepresentation, actual misrepresentation, not just omission, in normal, everyday, sexual, romantic relations. Isn't there? You know when somebody concludes says, isn't there, it's like he doesn't really have an argument for it. So it's <laughs> like, uh, but you know, cosmetics mis <laughs> misrepresent. They can convey information which is false. And then there are misrepresentations of feeling. So someone says, I really am, I have a serious romantic interest in you, or I love you, but it's not true. And then, those, then the two people have sex. Is that rape? Or if you want, make it, a, so you don't have to call it that, but I mean, first you should ask yourself, do you think that's rape? But if you don't want to use the word rape, should it be a criminal offense? More broadly, more interestingly, the real question is whether autonomy is the appropriate ideal or value for sexual relations. And I think there's reason to think the answer to that's no. Individual autonomy speaks for a certain set of interests and values, all of which revolve at bottom around the idea of drawing a sharp distinction between self and other, insulating the self from the impositions and the will of others. And that's necessary for a lot of existence. And, and, and it's, it's not that it's a wrong-headed ideal, or it's not that it's not a f of fundamental importance to us. But note that it may not be the lodestone ideal for sexual relations. There's something about sexuality that the ideal or value of individual autonomy is not well suited to capture. Don't you think? That's like where. <laughs> so um, uh, Freud, for one, thought that love was the greatest threat to ego because in love, the other's pain becomes our pain. The other's feelings become our feelings. An economist might say that the other's utility cur curve becomes our own. <laughs> this is not what individual autonomy aspires to. In those sexual relations where power, whether domination or submission, is eroticized and becomes part of sexual relations, 
It's pretty clear individuals are not pursuing individual autonomy in the classic sense that we understand that concept. But even if we imagine some idealized, perfectly egalitarian sexual relationship, even if we were to, it would still involve a commingling of bodies and subjectivities. I'm, I'm not saying it necessarily has to. I'm not saying every act of sex or every uh, has to. What I'm saying is this can be and is an important part of people's sexual lives, this commingling of subjectivities and, and bodies that the ideal or concept or value of individual autonomy is not well constructed to give us a handle on. From individual autonomy's view, from its viewpoint, sexuality is kind of a threat. It's like, oh man, it would be better if people weren't interested in that. From sexuality's point of view, autonomy, individual autonomy, is not so desirable. And don't forget that autonomy speaks in its fullest form toward I, towards ideals of, uh, about ideals of self-determination. We do not determine ourselves sexually. That's the myth that I refer to in my article. It's just a myth that self-definition applies to our sexual selves. For most of us, not necessarily all, but for most of us, our sexuality imposes on us. It is not something we choose. It's outside of those things. That, oh, sure, you're able to choose your actions in many ways. You don't have to act that. But if you're really interested in the ideal of self-definition, self-determination, you might really wonder whether that's the right ideal from sexuality's point of view. I mean, everybody knows that Kant's the great philosophical figure in the tradition of autonomy. You understand, of course, that for Kant, acting on desire is not autonomy. If you act on your desire, you are a slave to your passions. True self-determination autonomy meant not acting on desire. So for Kant, it was consistent with morality and autonomy to for a society to say that sexuality should only occur within heterosexual, copulative, reproductive, marital relations. He found that, that, that was his view about sex. It's very difficult to take, everybody thinks it's, oh, it's easy. I, they think, I understand what autonomy means. It means in the modern world, we just have to you know, realize it's uh, acting on your desires and, uh, as you freely would. It's not so easy as that if you're really thinking of self-determination as your goal. Okay, so those are the remarks about why, what might be wrong at some foundational level with the view that rape should be defined as sex without consent. The, the claim was that that actually backs up on, on an ideal of, it rests on foundations of autonomy-based thinking. And there are strong reasons to think that autonomy is not the right value or ideal for sexuality. However, for the rest of my uh, few minutes of talking, what I'm going to do, as I said, well, I'm going to try to deal with this problem. Well, if rape isn't sex without consent, what, what is it? What's the missing thing? I mean, what, what do you mean if it's not sex without consent? What, what is it? Here's one possible answer that might have occurred to you that some people give. The missing thing you have to add is coercion. Coercion would have this virtue. It would knock out sex by deception. So you could say, oh, I know what it is. Rape is sex plus coercion. And don't worry, rape by deception I, I'll, I'll get rid of. Now, in what follows, and for the rest of my few minutes, I'm, I'm going to say, no, that's, that doesn't do it. That's not sufficient. And. Just to skip some steps, the role of coercion in moral and legal thinking is, is pretty clear. Coercion is bad because it gets in the way of, it undermines, it interferes with autonomous decision-making. 
So it doesn't really help here. Like, why should the law, when the law is against coercion, it's against coercion because a consent given in the face of coercion isn't a true consent. And if that's what you're thinking, that rape is, that is, it's, con, it's, it's sex where the consent, if there was consent, was given in, under conditions where the consent wasn't true consent, you should still be against rape by deception. If you want an example to kind of bring this out, Imagine uh, two people, they're uh, engaged to be married, they've, they've promised to marry each other. Uh, because of religious scruples, they don't have sex. And they're not going, they don't plan to have sex till after marriage. But one of them says to the other, at a certain point, you know what, uh, this just is not working for me. I, I, you know, I, I've changed my mind, I've changed my mind fundamentally about this and, and we're gonna have to break it off right now unless you have sex with me first. I, I can't do this thing where I wait till we get married. I don't think that's the right way to live. I've changed my mind about that. I'm going to break off the engagement and break up with you unless you have sex, unless you agree to have sex. Now, this imposes, let's hypothesize, a devastating choice on the other person. That it would just be devastating to this person to be broken up with, have the engagement broken off. I suggest to you that this is coercive in a relevant moral way. It puts the person to a choice that they don't even think is a meaningful choice. It put the consequence is devastating. Now, I don't think that anybody would count that as a case. So that, let's say the person agrees, so, okay, I'll have sex. I don't think we want to count that as an act of rape. I posed this hypothetical in my criminal law class last year. And I asked, you know, so what, you cold call people, this is the Socratic method in law school, you don't let them raise your hand, they cold call on somebody. And I said, is that rape? You know, Miss X, and Miss X said, yes, I think that is rape. I was totally thrown off. I was so thrown off. I, uh, class is over. I got nothing to say. Like, it, it was the end of the Socratic battle. It's like she was supposed to say, that wasn't, and then everything else was going to follow, but, you know, nothing followed. So, um, but, um, but if you think that isn't rape, of course, you can say, oh, it's not coercion. But that's pretty coercive. That's really putting, that's subjecting someone to a devastating consequence by hypothesis. The reason why the woman in my class said, yes, I think it is rape, is because she had in her mind that rape is sex without consent. And she was understanding correctly, intuitively, correctly, that the hypothetical I had just posed was one where the person was saying yes to sex under conditions that weren't really manifesting her true autonomous you know, will. So in a way, she was right. But what she was wrong about was that that's a case of rape. And the fact that that's not a case of rape should tell you again that it's not consent that's doing the work. So what is rape if not just sex without consent? What is the missing term and concept? Well, unfortunately, I think it's force. It's force. Now, the law of rape for you know, well over 100 years has had a force element in it. And that's how, so I posed you that rape by deception case early on, and I told you American courts would agree with you. Every case where an American court says, where somebody, you know, a prosecutor comes in or somebody alleges rape by deception, an American court will say there was no force. That's why it's not rape. That's why that case is an easy case, because of rape's force requirement. Now the problem with the force requirement, everybody hates force requirement, everyone's against the force requirement, there's you know, a familiar set of objections to it. Look at statutory rape. The reason why the sex with a 17 or 16 or 15 year old is rape is because they're too young to consent. There's, it doesn't have to be any force. That's why, you know, force requirement, you can't make sense of that. Or sex under conditions of inebriation. There's no force there necessarily, but it's still rape, isn't it? And in general, the force requirement misses, fails to take account of all the many objectionable pressures that are put on people to induce them to have sex. The force requirement is blind to those pressures and does not produce an answer that rape has been committed in cases where social 
and peer pressure of a strong sort was brought to bear, but there was no force. Now, what the force requirement does do is it says that rape is a crime of violence. What the force requirement does do is it provides an answer both to the sex by deception problem but to the deeper, more foundational problem that I was alluding to because where force is required in the law, the law and, and in our moral judgment, our, our judgments, moral or legal, are responding to something beyond just consent, beyond just autonomy. I'll give you an example, slavery. If you have an employee and you lie to the employee about the wages that you're going to pay them, you say you're going to pay them X wages, but you're lying, you're not going to, you never were going to. In fact, you don't pay them anything. You lied to them. You have not enslaved them. You defrauded them. You tricked them, and no doubt they have an action against you, but you have not, from the, certainly from the law's point of view, but I think from you know any serious account of what slavery is, you have not enslaved them. To produce slavery or involuntary servitude, you have to do something much more. You have to chain them or whip or beat them or threaten to imprison them, to incarcerate them if they won't do their work. I'm giving you a list of what the requirements that the law imposes in, in, in its definition of involuntary servitude, but I think, again, this is a situation where there's some basis and justification for how the law treats this. Slavery, that is, has a force requirement. And I bring up that example. Slavery is involuntary servitude, and so is rape. Rape is an involuntary servitude. And I would suggest to you that we might do a lot better thinking about rape as a form of sexual slavery rather than an impingement on sexual autonomy. Obviously, rape is shorter in its duration than uh, most recognized acts of slavery. But something is done to a person's body that places them under the full possessory control of someone else, and their body is made use of and instrumentalized, and an involuntary servitude is imposed on them, rather totalizing, even if relatively short in duration. So I would suggest to you that the concept of sexual slavery and involuntary servitude might really be better foundationally. I, in my article, I talk about the concept and the right of self-possession, but I'm not going to go into that here, physical self-possession. But the concept of slavery might provide a better understanding of what the evil of rape is than an impingement of autonomy. Autonomy is impinged and infringed in so many ways. It doesn't capture the true evil and gravity of the act of rape. If that's right, we begin to see some sense in rape's force requirement because slavery and voluntary servitude is built conceptually around a force requirement, not just a violation of consent. and does not respond just to, say, misrepresentation the way all the laws that are based on consent do. Now, very briefly, and then I'll close, I'll just mention the what does this view say to those objections that I raised a second ago, statutory rape? All the pressures that are put on people short of force and the problem of uh, alcohol or intoxication more generally. So the case of statutory rape is, is actually, it's pretty easy to see what's really going on there when you start to think about it. Statutory rape is not the same crime as rape. It's not. It's, it's a different event. There are lots of things you can't do to minors, like you can't sell them beer or cigarettes. So the law expresses and, 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 and embraces a paternalistic view about what's right and wrong for kids to do. And uh, it doesn't let them smoke, and it doesn't let them drink, and it doesn't let them have sex. This is a morality law straight up. And the notion that minors cannot legally consent 
is just not true. So for example, in a case of actual forcible rape against a 16-year-old, prosecutors can charge the perpetrator with two crimes, statutory rape, which is consensual sexual relations between an adult and a minor, and actual rape, because they committed rape. There's two different crimes. And what courts will say in those cases is, in this case, the child did consent. Sorry. In this case, the child did not consent. In other words, when anybody actually thinks about it, they realize that children do and can consent to things, and there's stuff that happens they don't consent to. It's just not true that children can't consent. And when they don't consent to sex, something different has happened to them, and that's real rape. When they do consent, it's a different crime. It's statutory rape. If you want to hear more about that answer to the problem of statutory rape, I'm happy to talk about it. The pressures, short of physical force. Well, physical force, you could have a very narrow definition, or you could have a broader, more capacious definition. I, myself, am in favor of a very broad definition of what would count as physical force, broader than, to some extent, what the law currently recognizes. There's a famous case where a man threatened to lock a girl up if she didn't have sex with him, to lock her up in a room, in a, a barn. And the court said, well, oh, that's not rape. She had sex. He didn't you know, threaten to beat her. I mean, I would think that would clearly count as rape on my force-based view and should count. But as to the other pressures, peer pressure, social pressure, the answer that this view gives of rape, the force base, is that's not rape. So I, 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 I suspect people might want to ask about that, but I'll just say it straight out. It is a mistake, moral, legal, conceptual, cultural, to think that sex consented to under conditions of pressure, social pressure, peer pressure, to elide those cases with what we criminalize and, and, and condemn under the name of rape, or it doesn't matter if you use a different term, sexual assault. As to intoxication, well, here you have to distinguish between cases where people are so intoxicated that they're incapacitated. They, they're, they're either unconscious or so blind drunk that they don't know what's going on. In those cases, I think it's fair to say that force is being used on an unconscious person. Someone's got to move their body around. They've got to drag them around to take their clothes off without their, if the person is incapacitated in that way, they are not uh, uh, participating in the conduct. And I think it's fair to say that force is being used in those cases. But short of that, where we're talking about disinhibition, people making choices that they regret later under the disinhibiting effect of alcohol, I don't think it's rape. I'll close by telling you, if you go to the Yale, sorry, the Harvard Law School website, Allison, you may be interested in this, you will find the following two statements. Statement one, a consent given under the influence of alcohol is not consent. It says that, point blank. Go to the website, look it up. Now that's telling women, that's who it's aimed at, that if they drink and are under the influence, that their consent doesn't count and that they can claim to be raped or sexually assaulted later, which is false. The law will not protect them. That is not the law. University probably won't protect them. Certainly not if the Dear Harvard letter from last year is any evidence. It's giving people wrong information. As a matter of fact, it's not the law, it's not how it's going to be, and it's given them very bad advice. Just above that statement, on the law school website, is the following statement. Just above it. Inebriation is no excuse to or defense against a charge of rape. Now you read those two things, and everybody <laughs> thinks that's consistent. Sure, yeah, if the, if the aggressor, the man, is charged with rape, the fact that he's inebriated is no excuse, no defense. Yeah, that's right, that's the right answer, isn't it? Well, I just leave you with that puzzle. I mean, one of those statements is saying, choices made under the influence of alcohol, you're fully responsible for. Fully responsible as an agent, moral, legal, 
The other one is saying, choices made on the influence of alcohol, you are not responsible for. I don't think we can, you know, say both those things to people at the same time. As to the last point, we don't excuse drunks in other respects. It's no excuse if you run over somebody and you're driving drunk. It's not an excuse to say drunk. As to the beginning... Uh, I'm going to cut in on that. That's correct. And I agree with that. But I also agree, well, so I disagree with the next statement, that inebriate, that a consent given under the influence of alcohol is not a valid consent. What that statement, which I agree with, is that we are responsible for many choices we make. We can be held morally, legally responsible, depends how drunk we are. But the fact that you're intoxicated does not relieve you of responsibility for your choices unless you're really smashed and you don't even know what you're doing, then that's a different case. But in many cases, you are responsible. But that's the whole point. So we're, going, we're, we're, we're sticking with that idea, but then we're telling people, women, that if they go out and drink, then they're not responsible for the yes that they, and that's the, the problem. That's, that statement yeah. is wrong. I also, a lot of this seems to me to be terminology. Rape is a charged word. If you shift to fraud, it sounded to me like that case in Israel was justified as a fraudulent episode, but to invoke rape, I think, conjures up other, uh, other implications. Not dealt with is the difficult situation that there are some women who like to not give consent and be taken in. There may be men, I can't speak for but with men, with women, there are some who enjoy not giving consent and yet having sex. It's sometimes hard to tell between. And last point, I'd like to pose another hypothetical. Supposing a man and a woman are about to engage in consensual sex. The woman assures the man that she has appropriate contraception. <clears throat> it turns out that she's lying. They have sex. She gets pregnant. Does this relieve the man of the obligation for child support? Well, those are all great questions, and I'm, I'm definitely not sadly able to answer them all. I wish I could. You're a professor at Yale Law School. You asked my alma mater. I came here for guidance. <laughs> well, I'll do my best, but I um, uh, came here to ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> that too. So yeah, it, what if we don't call it rape? Let's call it fraud. Um, I think that's a very fair question. And I tried to, you know, deal with that a little bit in my remarks, saying, look, I, I tried to say, look, if we take the word rape out of it, does it change the picture? I don't think it really does. Like, I, I think most people in this room, most people in the United States, even if we don't call it the crime of rape, if we call it a new crime, sex by fraud, something like that, I don't think people are willing to throw the guy in jail. But it doesn't have to be a guy. If we broaden rape or sexual assault or sex crimes to cover fraud. There's no reason why we should gender it in any particular way. I don't think there's any evidence that <coughs> men are more likely to lie, in, although maybe there is, but I don't know of it, uh, on their way to sexual relations than women. Um, so I don't think it changes the picture. I think most of the argument will play out exactly the same way because I think most people's initial reaction would be, certainly mine would be, that should not be judged a criminal offense, whether we call it rape or not. Now, if you differ on that, say no. Once we call it sex by fraud, then I'm in favor of throwing those people in jail. I did not, you know, that's, I only made a few remarks about that. That was the autonomy stuff. I, I didn't, you know, I can't pretend to have given you a knockdown argument. Um, your, uh, your case about, you know, the, are there people out there who, 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 who kind of enjoy g having sex under conditions of not consenting? I think that's what you said? Right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think that's, that's probably true. I think, um, um, uh, I, I, I think that um, I, I tried to mention that a little bit when I talked about, you know, domination and submission as, you know, forms of sexuality that, that exist out there. Um, uh, now, in my own view, you know, you still, <laughs> the point is what has to be said yes to Okay, so there are people who, who, who have violence in their sexual relations all the time. You know? So you imagine a, 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 an S&M case. What has to be said yes to is the violence. We are living in a regime where people think what has to be said yes to is the sex. All right, young woman.
Didn't you, you, did you, did you have your, I'm sorry. Did, didn't you question. have your, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, did I not finish? Yeah, so, um, so what has to be said yes to is the violence, the force, and that's, uh, that's the key point. So the, um, the last question was? Was if a woman lies about having contraceptive protection. Yeah, yeah, they, they right. engage in sex, yeah. she becomes pregnant. Okay. Does her lie relieve the man, should yeah. it relieve the man of uh, child support? Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, I would want to stress that example as a case where you wouldn't want to think that, uh, um, that, that rape had been committed. Notice that if you really took seriously the, the idea of rape by deception, the woman in that case very arguably be guilty of rape, which I think would be a crazy result. As to whether it relieves a man of, 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 of uh, child support obligations, you know, I have no, this is the one I have no answer to. So if that's the one you were really looking for, I just, I don't have a thought out answer for it. Um, I guess I was wondering, um, with your definition of rape, if you would consider all consumers of prostitution rapists. Yeah, no, I wouldn't. You wouldn't. Yeah. Uh, not unless they use physical force. Yeah, because I would argue that they are. And you you're would argue that because I'll bet you're thinking that the women who are prostitutes, wait a minute, you think they're using force or you think that they're being, that I they're think rapists? The women are oftentimes forced uh -huh. into these situations against their will. Well, I think that if their pimp is the one doing the forcing, mm -hmm. I believe he might be guilty of rape, mm -hmm. even though he didn't actually have the sexual relations with them. But the, 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 the John, I don't know, unless he has reason to know. If he has reason to know, he could be complicit. And if you're complicit, you're chargeable with the crime. But, but, um, but otherwise, yeah. I certainly wouldn't want to have a general rule that prostitution is a form of rape, yeah. um, for, for <coughs> partly for the reasons I've yeah. been yeah. saying. Yeah, same thing with money, too, which is how money is on the table, too, in that situation. But I think in your example of the woman in, that was engaged, the yep. man said, yep. I will, I won't get married to you, right. and I'll break off the engagement. Right. And so, I guess. Well, I think it's a great point. So if you think that the exchange of money, especially for a person who really needs money, is coercive, yeah. that is, sex, then you actually should have the view you have. And you should be thinking, because you're properly recognizing that it's, that there's something a little bit undermined about the consent, although notice that, you know, in a capitalist economy, virtually every transaction is affected through money, and if that really was sufficient to undermine consent, well, every transaction would go crazy. So, but if you, you know, if you're having that view that if you, if, if your instinct is the money shows that the woman didn't really fully, truly consent, she wouldn't be having sex except for the money. You're thinking coercion. You're thinking consent, and you should end up with the view that you have. It just, I tried to suggest that that wasn't an adequate view for rape, but yes. Well, I think um, that your conclusion that the force requirement um, should be upheld is absolutely right. Mm. Um, and given the climate of opinion today, yeah. it needs to be reestablished that rape involves force. Um, but I'd like to put forth five propositions. Okay. Um, uh, effectively, um, five ways to make your argument uh, more accurate okay. still. Uh, one is rape is not sex. Uh, number two, rape and sex are not differentiated by force because while all rape involves force, some sex involves force. Uh, number three, uh, rape and sex are not differentiated by consent uh, because neither involves consent. If you're raped, you don't consent, you obey. And who in the world consents to sex? Uh, one wants, one takes, one doesn't uh, consent, one consents to a mortgage or surgery or marriage, um, all of which you have time to think about, um, days, weeks, or months to think over. Uh, number four, what differentiates rape from sex is neither force nor consent, but the element of total surprise. 
subbiness. As in walking into your apartment and suddenly having a hand over your mouth and something cold and hard against your head that you realize is gone. Um, number five, if rape needs to be uh, defined legally as a violation of a right, then the right it violates is not exactly the right to self-possession. Um, it's rather the right not to fear a sudden violent death. I, I say this because when you're being raped, uh, you're not worried about being possessed. You're worried about being killed. And when a gun is pressed against your temple <coughs> in the act, uh, you can't help but wonder, will he shoot me when he's finished? Um, so if defined as a violation of the right not to fear a sudden violent death and recognized as a sudden act, then rape is much more like torture than slavery, uh, at least if it's presumed that the slave doesn't worry every minute about being killed. But it would also be unlike torture if it's presumed that a victim can stop the torture by saying, uh, by saying something, assuming that torture is administered in order to extract information. So in what way, in that case, would rape be different from rob robbery? Well, perhaps in the degree to which one is um, made vulnerable and, and handicapped to escape. But um, in any case, rape defined as a violation of self-possession uh, doesn't capture its proximity to homicide. Well, that's very interesting. I appreciate all of those uh, suggestions. And uh, you know what? I agree with many of them. In fact, in my article, I use two analogies to try to understand rape better. Slavery being one of them, I mentioned that in my remarks, but torture being the other. Torture is, again, a crime, a wrong, an evil that goes beyond the lack of consent. Something is done to a human body. So in interrogation circumstances, if you trick someone into revealing the information you want, you tell them, I already know that, you somehow communicate that you already knew it, and they blab it, you haven't tortured them. So torture by trickery is also, interestingly, just as rape by trickery is not accepted and strikes many of us as. So I do agree with, with much of what you said. Uh, um, uh, but I, you know, I don't think that I would agree with all of it. Um, I think that uh, we could imagine a condition of where someone was raped, where they knew that they weren't going to be killed, and we would not want to say that that person had not been raped, even if they knew for a fact they were not going to be killed. And I grant you that would be hypothetical. A person never can be 100% sure. Um, and I do think that the threat of a and fear of a violent death is part of the experience that makes a great, 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 great many rapes so horrible. I, 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 I think you're right about that, but I, I don't know that I would agree that it could be made definitive of the act. So, but I, I'd want to think more about all that. Yes? How does your position differ from the California law being proposed by the program? Well, you know, I'm against that. So California just passed a bill that said uh, every college receiving funds from California in that state had to adopt the following policy. Namely, the policy that it is sexual assault on that campus subject to all the punishment and discipline that a person can be subject to if they commit sexual assault. It is sexual assault or rape, depending on basically the term sexual assault and rape are used almost interchangeably nowadays. It is sexual assault or rape to have sex under conditions where one party did not affirmatively, unambiguously consent beforehand to the specific activity being engaged in. Now that's the statutory law of California. And that's also, if you look at the definition of sexual misconduct at Yale, what I just said, that's the definition. 
and people are being found guilty of rape. I, I, I cannot disclose details. People are being found guilty of sexual assault for violations of that that would strike you as, if I, if I could tell you, which I cannot, as remarkable. I mean, like, you would not believe it. And uh, um, uh, so I'm against that. Um, I think that if, if I think consent, in, in, the expressions of consent in matters of sexuality are often ambiguous. Um, and uh, it, it would be impossible to operationalize truly that definition. In fact, much of sexual activity would be an offense. Um, and uh, uh, um, something more has to be present for sex to turn into sexual assault or rape. And that something more has been erased from people's consciousness, erased from our provisions, erased from the law. That something else is some form of violence or force. And again, you could define these things very broadly. To say this doesn't tell you exactly what rape law is going to look like. Because these terms, violence, force, can be defined broadly, narrowly. And as I said, I'm in favor of broad definition. But we need to come back, I think, to some, to, we need to have some element of that to make sense of the whole thing. Rory. To ask you what you think that if there are some general legal and philosophical implications of your critique of consent in the case of rape, um, it, it seems that you you went after autonomy, which is a the fairly new word and term being used in jurisprudence. But the idea, it seems you could trace it back, at um, least in our regime or its basis, to law to the idea of having property in your person. And if you want to move from consent and sex to uh, violence or force. Um, this might be useful in terms of courts of law, but I wonder whether that doesn't just pass the buck because it seems like the theory of consent is precisely what the force is violating. So it seems to me that in a certain sense you're still back to consent. And um, I, I, I try to think of the implications. I wonder what you, what you think of this. You mentioned in the case of prostitution that you can have this kind of critique of a social contract theory of consent that there's always implied coercion because of people being poor or rich, et cetera. Um, so that was a kind of classic critique of liberalism, sort of legal formalism, which hides coercion everywhere. Um, and you sort of said, well, if we do that, then suddenly we'll have to start considering you know, every interaction in a capitalist society as being coercive. Well, philosophically speaking, yeah, why not? I mean, why is it, it doesn't, it just seems to me that as soon as you say that, well, we shouldn't have um, rape being simple, simply you know, trickery, seduction, we shouldn't have to say that's fair, you know, fair and square seduction versus um, fraudulent seduction. Um, I, I don't see why we could just make that the case regarding sex and then not take into account all kinds of um, interactions, for example, marketing, uh, business relations, anything um, in which, you know, as they say, sex sells, in which um, the person supposedly consenting is being manipulated, doesn't have all the facts, even if there's no positive fraudulent activity that's easy to prove. So, so are you, can you really make an assault on, on you, consent in the sexual realm are you, are you, and leave other if, realms away? If police officers beat a suspect to get information out of them, you agree with me that's bad, right? I hope. <laughs> it depends if he's a terrorist or, you know, what they're trying to get out of him, I guess. But uh, probably bad, yes. Let's, you know, let's tell you it's a bank robbery and they arrest somebody and the police beat him to, like, get some fact or confession. Right. Uh, interrogation. Okay. It's bad. Okay. Now. What if they trick them? And they, uh, you know, they say, we know you did it, and we have all this. Somebody's come up and told us. And based on that act of fraud, the guy confesses. Like he, in fact, what, you know, they, 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 they've lied to him. They don't have the evidence, but they get him. Now, most people think that's very different. Many people think that's fine. They, they think, you know, there's something, you know, nasty. But they think it's much better than having beaten him. Now, I myself take that view. And I would be surprised if you wanted to say it is incoherent ever to be against force in a situation where you're not prepared to be against trickery. So as I was mentioning, you know, slavery is another example of this. In other words, I think we could find that there are contexts of relations, whether they're governmental agents or just human beings, private individuals, where we would be against one person using violence, where we might not be against lies, at least certain kinds of lies. 
So to me, the way I would want to reflect on that is, it might be, it might turn out that there are spheres of life and relationships where autonomy is the right goal. I didn't make an anti-autonomy argument writ large. So when it comes to protecting people's property, their goods, autonomy might be the right idea. We might want to protect them against both force and fraud. But it might turn out that there are some areas of life where we want to protect people against force, but not trickery. And that might be surprising, but it looks like sexual relations is one such area where this is true as a matter of our social practices and our law. It looks like slavery might be another one. It looks like torture might be, now torture is just the interrogation thing taken to an extreme. Um, but uh, um, so I wasn't making an anti, I believe you can hold on to the principle of autonomy and I believe you can apply it to many different situations. I don't think that suddenly, you know, the whole thing is thrown out because it turns out people are taking money for when they give up their, their property. This is an old question in political theory. You're right. You'd have to have an answer to that. But I, so my position would be protect autonomy when it comes to, to goods, to the marketplace. So the marketplace should protect against both force and fraud. But there are some areas. Here's another example. It might seem kind of weird to you out of left field. It is out of left field. But um, kidnapping. So you get in a car. Someone has lied to you. They, they get you to come into their car telling you X when X wasn't true at all. Now, maybe they're taking you to a surprise party. Nobody thinks that's kidnapping. Kidnapping requires force. It's just odd. But you go and you look at the statutes. It turns out that kidnapping has been, for centuries, defined as in, it doesn't happen when people are tricked. It happens when, now, that's a puzzle. That's a puzzle. When do we, when does the law, and when do we, in our judgments about certain wrongs, certain evils, demand force, and when do we also say, no, no, it's the same evil if you get their prop. We say that of larceny, we say it of trespass, we say it of battery, but we don't of kidnapping, of slavery, or rape. And that's actually, in a way, the, a, a point that I was drawing attention to, which people really have not paid attention to in law, or to my knowledge, in jurisprudence, you know, more broadly considered. So. Yes. Thanks for your thoughts on this, because it's a very difficult topic. But I want to just follow up what you were just saying. Yeah. I think we can all imagine cases of justified force, assault, justified homicide, mm. even. Are you saying there are no cases under which, in your doctrine of rape as force, or involved force, there could be justified rape? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, you know, if you gave me some crazy hypothetical, I, I, you might throw me off on this, but yeah. Now, well, just you, say can, you could force someone into a car yeah. for good. For good reasons. Yeah. And, and people would say it's a very, very dangerous situation. And maybe, gosh, it's really have to think this through. But yeah. there could be for sure. a child or somebody who's ill or for various reasons. It could be for that person's good to be forced to be kidnapped. Yeah. There could be obviously cases where you kill somebody. Yeah. The law will justify it. Yeah. But I'm wondering is there something special about sex that you would say there's no justified? Well, I mean, the theories of use of justified force in the law are, you know, very, it's a long story, there's a long literature, there's many people have written about this, and in philosophy as well. And the, 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 the difficulty here the, is that, so the general structure of arguments for justified force is that it was reasonably necessary to achieve some goal. And it's just hard to think of a situation like, you can see where you might need to throw somebody in a car to save their lives, you can see you might need to shoot somebody down to stop them from killing somebody else. Just so it's hard to imagine. Uh, as I said, you can construct a hypothetical, I'm sure. So you can't, but... The founding it, of Rome, right? No, no, it's not just... <laughs> I know that's international it's, relations. No, it's not. See, you don't... I think you want to avoid hypotheticals where, like, someone points a gun... Okay, so you could... Someone points a gun at somebody else, a child, and says, if you don't rape X, I will shoot the child. Okay, and you're just in a, a very old philosophical box. And your answer to that will depend on your answer to that general question. You know, a terrorist points a gun at a child and says, now you go and kill 20 people or I'll kill the child. Or, or, or you go and kill one person or I'll kill three children. You know, mm -hmm. So I don't have any special answer to that question that doesn't apply to that whole range. It's an excellent question. And what I do think is that People, this is what I was saying before, people do use force in some sexual relationships, but the critical thing is that the force has to be consented to. So I'm not against consent, I'm not against autonomy as a value. So 
the force has to be consented to. Mm -hmm. And if it's not, and so it's actually force, um, um, then I, it's, I'm very hard pressed to say that in a normal circumstance there would ever be justified. Right, that's why I just wonder if consent really comes in the back door for you. Yeah, in, it does. It's not the back door. It's not the back door. It's, it's that we have to understand what has to be consented to. It's not the sex. There is a rape is sex without consent. Rape is violent sex where the violence, the force, has not been consented to. Professor Johnson. I, I read your article over the summer and uh, I still learned more in this conversation, which I think is the hallmark of a very good talk, so thank you for that. Um, first, I want to point out Or else a very bad article. <laughs> <laughs> a very good article. I also appreciate, as a professor of German and Austrian history, that you mentioned both Freud and Kant, and I'd like to point that out to all the Americanist students in the room, and it's very useful to take your history. A point of information first. The website you referenced, the law school is the Harvard Women's Law Association, and it's a parsing of the university policy, and it's incorrect. It is, <coughs> someone will be found in violation of university policy if they have, uh, or will have found, conduct, sexual conduct is considered unwelcome if a person is incapacitated for any reason, including intoxication, which is different from being under the influence of alcohol. So, um, and then, I understood your talk to be largely about criminal law, but in some of your comments you've opened the door for a question about the difference between criminal law and university regulation. So you described a number of behaviors which you convincingly argued are obnoxious but not criminal, and we do not criminalize being a jerk. Although clearly, in some of the scenarios you laid out, the person's behavior we would find morally repugnant. In the context of a university setting, if a university avoids the use of criminal law terms, like rape, which is defined in criminal law, and stays with terms that are relevant in the educational environment, such as discrimination and harassment, and wants to include as violations of the university sexual harassment policy, some actions that look more like your the coercion section of your talk, where there's not physical violence, but there's also not only trickery, seductive trickery. Is, is, do you think that there is, sort of from a principled perspective, a wider range of actions at a university here that it's not a, they're not criminal actions, they're just not consistent with the kind of behavior that the university wants to endorse? Um, and you have clearly taken a stand against affirmative a la Yale or California, but there's a wide range of other ways to describe and define unwelcome conduct in the And I just wonder if you, if, if you could make a few comments on any distinctions you see in those two different zones of action. Sure, those are both great points. So just first on the, the first, yeah, I did not mean to suggest in my talk that it was official Harvard or Harvard Law School policy to proclaim, I yeah. I just want to make sure everybody, the, nobody misunderstood. Yeah, you didn't say it was yeah, so the, that Harvard, like almost every uh, institution and, and state, only makes intoxication an invalidation of consent if the person is so intoxicated they are incapacitated. That's the, the typical term, although you can find cases in California that go further than that. But, so the, yeah, this was wrong statement of the of actual university policy being given out to all these students, which is bad. We need to stop. Yeah. Okay. Now, yes, the answer is absolutely. Universities are free to make. Okay, so like criminal law is like a floor, and universities are free to make a lot more stuff. Disciplinable conduct, and they do. So I don't know what Harvard's position on hate speech is, for example. Um, uh, uh, there are some colleges and universities that are not publicly owned but private that ban hate speech of certain kinds, even though a state couldn't because it would be unconstitutional. You know, so you can't have a hate speech crime of, of, of certain typical uh, forms. You, you could not prosecute somebody for that, so it doesn't exist as a crime. But there's plenty of institutions that say there are certain things you can't say on our campus. And Colleges and universities, are private ones, are allowed to do that. And I have no 
principled objection to it. And um, uh, it depends, you know, what kind of culture and what kind of values they espouse and, 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 and are trying to embrace and, and create. Um, so, is the realm of sexuality a realm where I think they are totally free to? You could have, for example, a regime on a college campus of full disclosure. So you could have a regime, no, misrepresent, no misrepresentations. You could even have, you must disclose everything affirmatively, so no omissions of relevant material information. And so there's no doubt that colleges can do this or, or some intermediate thing. There's no doubt they could make coercive forms or deliberately getting someone intoxicated, okay, with their knowledge. So obviously anybody's going to prevent roofing, but I mean, you know, deliver, you know, you could, you could try to stop the sex intoxication culture that's so prevalent in some of the clubs and fraternities all over the country if you could reach it and if you could do it. Um, but uh, uh, so there are questions about whether you'll sort of just be making a mockery of the university policy, like you announce something and in fact it's happening all over the place, you can't reach it. and it, it, what you're just doing is multiplying the embarrassments of what the law is and the policies are already. Because in some ways it's worse to say you can't do this than everybody's doing it. Um, and then of course you have questions of value and, 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 and culture. Like what kind of sexual culture do you think is the right one? Or does a university or its decision makers think is the right one to, to, uh, to, to, to nurture, to try to create? And these are hard questions, but there's no doubt you're right. A university, my remarks, my arguments really are directed toward the law less to a lesser, I mean I'm trying to say some stuff about these values and cultural um, but matters. But too, your comment about consent yeah. is a complicated concept. Yeah. I mean you can say universities have the right to do blah 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 yeah. and still advise universities yes. not to choose and a that's particular way. what I've been trying to do. It's not irrelevant. Yeah. So I've, I've written against the current definitions of sexual misconduct and consent at Yale and gets me in hot water, but I, I think they've got it wrong. So, uh, Chris McClure. Hi, I agreed with uh, most of your points, and I just wanted to ask a question about uh, your the boundaries of, of force and the threat of force. And as you were talking, I imagine what I assume is not a very rare situation where uh, a woman says no, the man gets really mad, starts yelling, maybe kicks a table. Uh, she's genuinely afraid. He makes no explicit threat, but she genuinely feels very threatened. He has no intention of actually you know, taking this any further. He's just, you know, but then she says, fine, fine, fine. You know, it's, you know, that, she perceives it as a real threat, but he never threatened her, and so she could, could he be charged with rape in, in your understanding? Well, in criminal law, the question you've raised is, is the mens rea question. That is, uh, should the law focus? So you have two possible standards that would be logically consistent with everything I said. <coughs> One in which the man has to, has to have taken either deliberately or negligently action that would um, uh, 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 cause uh, uh, a reasonable person to fear violence that was going to be directed at her. So on the intentional view, the man has to have intended that threat. On the negligence view, if he took action that she reasonably considered to um, uh, uh, be a threat against her, even though it wasn't his intention, then he's still guilty. I myself have argued for the latter position in rape law. So if she, re so the man cannot take action that would reasonably be construed by the other person, whether it's a man or a woman as a threat against them. And if it's true that the actions taken were reasonably construable as a threat, that's the end. He has no defense. He can't, well, I didn't mean it. I didn't intend it. I wasn't gonna. Doesn't matter. So if he's, you know, he's a big guy and it's a dark street and there appears to be nowhere to go, there are certain things that, you know, if he says them and she reasonably or he reasonably considers them to be threatening, then he's at his peril. And of course that's true in the law in many areas. People are at their peril for having done things that other people reasonably construed in a certain way. 
And I think that's a fair way to draw the line. Logically speaking, you could demand intentionality on the part of the man, but I, I don't see any reason to do that. Yes. Uh, 10 or 20 years ago, I was talking with one of your tallest and most creative colleagues, I don't know if you want to be associated with him, um, about this question, and he had something very practical that you could do um, just to solve this. And um, they'll all laugh probably, but <clears throat> that's where the most creative ideas in economics. He suggested that the woman has to sign a permission form. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll elaborate on it. We could have a three day cooling off period, if you like. And we could have liquidated damages of $100,000. And um, there are no excuses. If, uh, if there's no form, the man's at his peril then. And uh, we could make a civil suit also, so it isn't, so the woman herself can be suing end up to a prosecutor or university board. What do you think of that? So you could do it. And you could, like, that's another thing universities could do. Or, or how about, you know, a cell phone app that you, you have to <laughs> consent, but to get to the place where you click yes, you have to actually go through something that's kind of difficult to do. So, like, it's a test of your, how intoxicated you are. Yeah, and if you can't get it, you can't press yes. It just exists. Right, it exists. Yeah, it's no, this is not hypothetical. So, so you can do it. You can do it. Um, and depending on like how hard you like that you pretty extreme I think you sign a form and then like a three-day cooling off period that kind of thing. so you know um, these are logically possible ways of cashing out legitimate consent now for myself I do not define rape as a violation of consent so the person you know hasn't signed those forms and then sex happens and somebody says, oh, so that was rape, right? And I said, no, no, that's what you're doing there is you're cashing out some concept of effective communication of consent. I don't want to define sexual assault and rape in those terms. But the question of whether, let's say, a university or a state might want to define rape that way, and they could, you know, comes down to, you know, again, the kind of sexual culture questions. <laughs> well, it doesn't sound like too much fun to have to sign the form. It would eliminate certain behavior that, you know, um, so you might think was like too bad you had to eliminate it. but um, <laughs> but um, you know uh, it would probably have benefits too so from an economic point of view there might be it, it might uh, the costs might well outweigh the benefits and uh, um, so um, so I, I but I guess the fundamental point is you are talking about defining sexual assault in consent based terms and then we're arguing about how to operationalize the communication of consent and of course my whole presentation is oriented to saying that's not the way we should be thinking about it. I might go further and require the father's signature too. <laughs> I'm sure there are some who would disagree with that. All right, Anna and then Adam. Um, yes, thank you. I enjoyed your talk and this discussion very much. Um, I was wondering whether your concept of rape captures in any way that there might be our intuitions, the difference between a man raping another man in prison, for instance, and a man raping a woman, which, I mean, that's, it's very hard to get at what exactly is, is the difference and what's, mm -hmm. maybe it's not that hard, maybe mm -hmm. it's very, very clear and there, most people today are a bit obtuse, but it seems that there is, it, it, there is a difference in, in those two things, and it's not just due to the fact that women can be pregnant from but there's a greater somehow violation of some kind of a social or civilized contract that has been, you know, that's like a foundation. Mm -hmm. of very, mm -hmm. So is there room for some kind of differentiation in your What a great question. I, um, there is room. Nothing in what I say is inconsistent with such a view. I myself don't have that view, um, but uh, um, um, one could have it. Uh, uh, you know, the, the problem of male rape, where the male is the victim, has been systematically suppressed. So, it, you know, not long ago, it was you know the the the, the law did not recognize the rape of men. It just wasn't. A legal possibility and even now you can read statistics of rape if you go on like Wikipedia and you read rape statistics 
It's like they don't include all the rapes of men in, 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 typically in prison. Um, so when they talk about you know what percentage of, of the genders are, are, are victimized by rape, they just you know exclude that. But um, what's of fundamental importance about your question is that it raises the um, issue of what sort of gravamen, what the basic violation of rape consists of. And there was a time for centuries and centuries where the fact that a woman was the victim of it made a central defining difference because it was considered to be a much more fundamental violation to penetrate a woman against her will than, in other words, sex was differently, had a different moral place in the lives of men and women. For women, it threatened ruin, defilement, violation, the destruction of virtue in a way that it never threatened men. So men could go around having sex, and that was bad behavior, but it didn't ruin them. And it wasn't a fundamental violation if they were, you know, you know, libertine. But if a woman did the same thing, she was, you know, damaged goods and 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 ruined and destroyed. Um, and those are all terms that are actually used in the literature <laughs> not that long ago. I, uh, you know, so the theory that I present in this paper would not distinguish between, and it tries to have a gender neutral concept of this right of self-possession, but you know, so I, the, the question is, can you articulate and give substance to the view that you suggested without falling back into certain views about the difference between men and women that you might object to. Uh, I, mean, I don't know if you would object to them, but uh, um, that might be objectionable. Um, uh, and, and that's the, the, the big question there. Adam. Uh, thank you. I, I really enjoyed the presentation. And I agree with uh, your basic point that the absence of consent should not be uh, the definition of rape, but just to push a little bit on the idea of force or violence, a hypothetical, relatively realistic, I think, say somebody says, well, I won't lock you in a room or I won't hit you, but if you don't sleep with me, I'll spread the nastiest rumors about you, um, discredit uh, entirely your social standing. Yeah. What would you do with that sort of case, and how does it um, relate to your definition of force? Well, so the person might be guilty of blackmail. So blackmail is a crime that consists of threatening to do X, where X is something like that, revealing bad or criminal behavior about somebody unless they comply with some request. Now, that request could be money. I'll, you know, you gotta pay me 500 bucks, or else I'm gonna spread this stuff. Now, if the stuff is lies, that's a different kind of crime. But if the stuff's true, they're actually, you know, so the law has a view about this, and most people, not everybody, interestingly, um, most people agree that there's something wrongful about that behavior, and so I would want to agree it's wrongful, and I would want to say that somebody could be charged with or condemned for having committed an offense that we might call blackmail. But do I think it's rape? I think that's a difficult question, and uh, um, I think it is one of many questions you can pose about coercion, because what, what we feel is that there's something coercive about that. So here is another example. Um, the boss says, I will fire you unless you have sexual relations with me. And I hope that most of us would want to say that's unlawful, improper behavior. It is a form of sexual harassment, and the person could have be found to have committed a criminal offense, civil offense. And let's say the individual in question, whether it's a man or woman, says, okay, I'll have sex with you because I don't want to be fired. And let's not add in things about they'll starve if they don't have this job. But because they like the job, they have sex. Um, interestingly, the law right now does not treat, and there have been cases like this, you can imagine. And the law doesn't view this as rape, which is, and it should if it takes the idea of consent seriously. But instead, it, it's actually what's 
organized in these cases is the concept of force. Of course, that's not an answer to your question. It just repeats the problem that you're asking me about. My inclination is to distinguish. I'd want to say that those people are doing something wrongful, but they're doing something wrongful in the same sense in, in which the guy, the blackmail guy, he's not, he's, he's guilty of something, whether he asked for money or sexual favors. And I think I don't see that as an act of rape. No, you know. Would you say in some cases it could be worse than rape? I mean, depending. Saying, you, you know, you lock someone in a room, that's it's not a nice thing to do, but it might be far worse to just totally ruin somebody's social standing and honor. I know, but it, it could be really, really, really bad for people. I mean, we could give the hypothetical to and make it infinitely bad to threaten to break up with somebody. That could be, for that individual human being, that might be worse than having that rumor spread about them, let's say. So, I, I mean, it, it, as a hypothetical, it would be hard to fight the hypothetical. It's like, it's possible. Yeah. But I don't think we want to say that's rape. You know, I'll break up with you unless you have sex. I, and the person says, okay, I'll have sex. I don't think that any, certainly I don't want to call it rape. So I'm just not prepared to say, have sex with me or bad consequences will follow, quite bad consequences for you. I, now, if you are, if you want to, if you're ready to take that step, you, you at least have to think about these other cases where we do allow people to, I'll divorce you. Mm -hmm. You know, you've stopped having sex with me, you're married. Wait a minute, that's not my idea of marriage. You know, I'm going to divorce you. And let's assume that's a pretty devastating consequence for somebody. But you can say to them, well, if we don't still have sexual relations, you know, I'm, I'm sorry. I, nobody thinks, you know, at least I don't think that that's rape, and it's generally nobody would, I mean, the law wouldn't, and most people I don't think would think so. So at least you have to think through that kind of thing. It's a great question, though. Thank you. Yes. Um, yes. I was actually going to point out the boss-employee uh, relation, and I, w I would actually be in favor of framing it as force yeah. um, and as rape. Um, and I, I, I do think that there are certain power relations that I would think of framing it as forcible and would include it in the law as rape in the, in the case of uh, state officials or bosses or husbands or wives, if possible, or boyfriends, and that, that are requesting sex and getting sex and in a case-by-case -case scenario, that I, I would think that, that it is possible to think of like psychological force. Mm. I was going to ask you. I, I know, like, I know your answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> but my take on it is that the the force idea is, is good. Yeah. Uh, consent is problematic, but I do think that through through that and the comparison with torture, I like it. Uh -huh. um, but I do think that overlooking these cases does let a lot of people I don't really like jail I don't think everybody should be thrown into jail uh -huh. but I do think people should be sanctioned and we should try to deter these kinds of activities and I do think uh, threatening people to perform sexual activity uh, is bad yeah. <laughs> um, so maybe the jail thing is uh, the bad idea, but we, I don't know, I do think that uh, yeah. uh, the, uh, psychological force mm -hmm. uh, should maybe be included. Yeah. In well, I think this is a similar, good following question to Adam's, and uh, it's a great question. And yeah. so force could be defined in many different ways. Uh, obviously, there can be such a thing as psychological force. And um, a force-based view of rape is not, does not logically exclude any, you know, it's a question of how do you define force. Now, I do think there are problems when you begin to take psychological force into the um, equation. Um, you know, I would pose to you some of the same, like, so a, a man who is married, so I will divorce you if we don't continue to have sexual relations. At least that's a question, you know, you have to think about because that's a threat. You know, I will divorce you. And uh, it could be quite bad for the person. Yes. And I didn't understand, did you think that was rape? I think that is rape. Okay. I, like, okay. For example, I would much rather 
be better than yeah. divorced, maybe. You, you'd maybe. rather be better? Maybe, yes. Okay, but, uh, well, you know, so I don't think that's rape. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but yeah, I don't think I have a knockdown argument. Say, you know, yes or no. I, but boy, that really. Uh, so my intuition is run very strong the other way there. And so, in, in a marital relationship, people can, you know, have certain expectations. And if the other person says no, I won't. Then it's like, well, okay, I'm not going to be married to you. So, um, <laughs> so I don't know. But I think most people think that, and I, I really am not sure you really want to go there. I, that may be your instinct, but I don't know. You're so. Um, uh, if you're ready to go there all the way, then you've got a perfectly consistent position. And many people do want to say that the boss who threatens the person with firing um, is guilty of, of rape. Um, so that's, I think, a much easier case on your side. And maybe the blackmail case might be another one. I just think physical violence is not always the biggest threat for some yeah. people. Just, yeah, yes, homicide, yeah. but, but not <coughs> for me yeah. as a woman. Sometimes I would rather maybe um, be better than lose my job yep. or my house, mm -hmm. if that were the case. If a yeah. government official threatened to do something really bad to yeah. my like standing as a yeah. in my country or something. Well, I would just say that what you're doing is you're filtering everything through some concept of consent, of true meaningful consent. So you're asking yourself, well, what would I not really want? So under what conditions would I consent to sex where I didn't really want it? I didn't really, it wasn't a true, meaningful, valid expression of my will. And if you have that in mind, you're definitely going to find that all kinds of cases of pressuring, psychological coercion count for you. And you're going to be instantly drawn to saying that those things are rape. So, you know, I mean, I was trying to give arguments why we should not think about rape that way. If you do, you're definitely going to end up in a different, a different position. Uh, Professor Johnson, go ahead on that. I'm sorry, I can't no. help myself. It's so interesting. Um, it seems to me like the word rape is doing an awful lot of work in this yeah. conversation. Yeah. It's doing work for you because you're protecting the, it, it's sort of the integrity of the meaning of the word. And it does work for other people because there's a way that it sounds like when you say that isn't rape, you're saying that's not bad. Or that's not as bad as something that is rape. And I'm, I'm wondering, and when we think about this wide range of actions that people you've described and other people have described that offend us but that you are saying are not rape and some people are saying but that's isn't that worse than something else you've told me is rape what is your position on some of these things being criminal offenses but having a different name you, right. you brought this up a little bit in your talk and kind of dismissed it you said we could have sexual fraud but you really want someone going to jail for blah 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 yeah. so then the issue is well is jail time the right sanctioned for, right. for an offense, but yeah. there's this notion, I think, of a wide range of actions that yeah. people would like to see see recognition are wrong yeah. and possibly criminal yeah. that aren't rape yeah. without a, this one is worse than that one, hierarchy of, of, of um, the, the status of how deeply offended you've been for the action. Yeah. So do you, have you heard people talking about things that you think belong in a category of sexual crime, not just existing non-sexual crimes like blackmail and fraud, but sexual crime that are not rape? Or do you think they should all be, they should all fit somewhere, whether it's kidnapping or blackmail or fraud? Or well, it's another great question. In some ways, it's the fundamental analytical question. I, if it were true that my argument was just sort of semantic and everything shifts, if you don't use the word rape, that would be it a weakness. That would be, it wasn't that great an argument after all. So I would hope that most of the argument would survive even if we change the name and we're criminalizing it under some other name. Um, but uh, so for example, someone lies about whether they have a sexually transmissible disease on their way to having sex with somebody. Now I believe that, that a state that writes a statute says that's a criminal offense in our state. Nothing wrong with that. There are very good reasons to make that a criminal offense. That's a form of sex by deception. So there can be plenty of sex crimes that aren't rape. They could even, I use that example because that's a clear example of deception being made into a ground of criminality. I'm not making an argument that, ooh, that should not be criminalized because that's mere sex by deception. What I'm saying is we shouldn't understand the general problem of sexual assault, to not use the word rape. I don't know if that changes it very much. Or the general, we shouldn't have a general view 
that lying, even about a material piece of information that was important to somebody, that that should make you guilty of a criminal offense, whether we call it rape, that as a general matter, misrepresenting some material, something that was important to somebody else, that should not generally be a criminal offense, whether we call it rape or something else. That doesn't mean that there should be, there could be a, there could be crimes of imposition that were like the blackmail case or like the employer case. Now what I was trying to do in my answers then was saying, look, we already criminalize that behavior under other things that I can explain why those cases are offenses, but under some other understanding, as soon as you strip that out and it's just a husband and a wife, like then I'm saying, wait, do you really want a criminal? But so I think there can be plenty of sex offenses that don't count as force. They're not rape, they're not assault, like the, uh, like the, uh, uh, the, um, the, the, if you misrepresent a sexual, uh, whether you have a disease. So um, the, the analytical answer to that has to be that I am open to the criminalization of plenty of sex crimes that don't involve force. But the argument does also have to be that we should not think that sex by deception is generally a crime, whatever we call it. Um, um, th that, that's the, the heart of the argument. Well, I'm, I'm afraid we have to stop even though uh, there are more questions. Uh, it, it shows how well you've spoken, despite the fact, or even because of the fact, that everything you said was so questionable. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thanks so much.